Okay, I've got something here that I picked up and read now. Um, titled The Complete Hammer Slammers, Volume 1. Uh, this is David Drake. I know I discussed Drake before. I don't know if I read a book by him that was outside the Slammers uh, world view. Although I may have, like I know he's done some stuff that's not related to the Slammers, but is in the same universe, and it may have been something like that. I don't know. Um, I wouldn't. I wouldn't have been able to tell uh, unless it had something explicit in it that you know, like stating Slammers or something. Uh, but uh, I think my reaction to it had been kind of. lukewarm at best. I don't know if I kept it or not. It, uh, it was, uh, you know, it was interesting enough that I read it, but, uh, th this is what he's really well known for, and I've read a fair amount of Slammers before, so some of these, I mean, this is a nice thick book. I don't know, you know, I don't know what he drew from. You can, you can kind of look here, uh, and, you know, there's like, uh, one, two, three, four, five collections of Slammer stories already in existence. Are they all in here? I don't think so, but, because it says volume one, um, but, you know, Whatever you know, maybe this is a, maybe this is the five that were already collected that are seen as the best or or something along that line. I found this a particularly interesting way to uh, to sort of approach a storyline. It's basically a series of short stories, but they do tell a broader arc of of the characters, etc., uh, arranging. From, hey, here's an introduction to what the Slammers are, then some stuff that throws you back to where they kind of got their start without actually going into that, um, but going into fairly early stuff uh, about their, you know, that, that touches on their, their, their origins politically and whatnot. Um... It's never outside of them as a mercenary company. Like, you know, Colonel Hammer is someone who had served in a particular military and then ended up kind of like, uh, kind of like Blackwater, kind of like, <laughs> uh, 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 what the fuck is the, uh, the Russian one? which now has slipped my mind. I know that, the, the, uh, as they put it, amateur parachutist, <laughs> amateur failed parachutist, Prigozhin, um, Wagner, uh, but kind of, kind of like that, was really tightly associated with a country to begin with, but then did something that's very, like, very rare, I don't, I can't think of an example, um, which is essentially turned, what was being backstabbed by their country and turned on it and forced their own existence as an independent uh, mercenary force. But in some of the earlier stuff, it's very clear, like some of the stuff that's more middle of their life, but earlier in his writing, it's very clear that there are mercenary companies all over the place, right? Uh, now, the writing's good. Um, I find the kind of combat discussion and whatnot to be not terribly interesting, to tell you the truth. And that was always, I guess, sort of my take on it was, this is something, and even in the, in the uh, introduction by Gene Wolfe, uh, you know, they go into how big a deal it is that Drake, you know, served in the military as uh, a tanker, basically. So he was bringing a lot of his own experiences t 
to this. Now, Wolf actually says something which is BS, which is he's looking at it and saying, I can't think of another author who, you know, served in the military and wrote military stuff. Well, in the afterward, Drake more or less contradicts all that by like calling out uh, Haldeman and, uh, was it Pornell? Um, for writing about, you know, science fiction about their, they, they, that was related to their own military experience uh, and, and real military experience, you know, not like, uh, you know, one of, one of, one of the things that uh, Wolf brought out is like, well, Hemingway was just, you know, while he was certainly seeing the effects of the combat, he was serving as, um, uh, I don't remember what the, the, that term is either anymore. The guys who, who not medic, but uh, who, who deal with, you know, carrying people around in stretchers and stuff like that. So he wasn't really serving in a, in a pure combat role. And, and for me, I mean, my thought went immediately to, ah, there were a couple of authors who came out of the American Civil War, and one stuck in my head immediately, which was Ambrose Bierce, and yeah, indeed, he served in and wrote about uh, military stuff in his fiction. So uh, that, that was kind of a bullshit side of, <laughs> of the intro as far as I'm concerned. And somebody should have prevented that from being added. Um, but uh, I, I didn't find the combat discussions and everything to be particularly more intriguing than, say, Heinlein, who did not serve, but who wrote good, good uh, ground fighting type stuff in, 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 in uh, you know, uh, in Starship Troopers, or, or or a number of other science fiction writers that I felt like. It's just that that's not what's interesting to me. And that was always my worry with Hammer Slammers, was how much of the stories would be about that. And they're actually really not. Um, a lot of them are about, are more about, and, and you have to, what, one of the things is Drake served in Vietnam, which was a particularly uh, problematic situation, right? Where horrible things were being done, but in a way they kind of had to be done in order, you know, to maintain the safety of the units that were involved, etc. Obviously, some horrible things were done that were just beyond the pale. But there, there's, you know, this beautiful, uh, just uh, one where there's this ancient alien, you know, huge artifact that both the cultures that are hiring mercenaries uh, revere and see as sort of the most important thing in the universe. And the fighting ends up destroying, <laughs> essentially. And, and, you know, neither of them would have chosen that. So that kind of, that kind of moral problem uh, is added into into uh, the situation, the concept of like, you know, neither side, had they not had mercenaries, would have fought anywhere near these things, but because there were mercenaries, one side chose to, to dig in in them, um, and the other chose to, <laughs> to fight in them, even though... Um, even though the government actually tried to step in and say, no, you're fired, go away. <laughs> the mercenary units actually had their own honor in, in play and had, and had to continue uh, their situation. It's just an interesting thing. Others is where there's uh, political intrigues going on and whatnot. Um, some that just show a point of the bullshit of military life, right? And... Not in a horrible anti-military way or anything like that. Just in a very much of a soldierly way, right? Um, 
projecting into these different societies, uh, etc. I gotta swap batteries in a way that I found much, much more pleasing than anything to do with the military aspects. Now, the simple fact that the military aspects show a certain verisimilitude. Sometimes the words don't completely evade me still. Sometimes this brain still kind of works. Uh, is, uh, I think, important to portraying the story. But... I don't know. <laughs> it, it, it's more, what, what I find more realistic and believable is how the soldiers interact with one another. Um, and now he had to project some stuff there from, because in his time, the U.S. military, you know, the ground forces, the guys holding the guns, were all males. That's not the case anymore, and he had to kind of... Um, project in what it would be like because there are female characters in the military units. I don't know where he worked to try to get that knowledge, just whether he imagined it or uh, uh, tried to tried to operate with, uh, you know, try, tried to question some people, say, in the Israeli military who had... Uh, uh, ground combat females, I think, certainly by the time some of this was being written. I'm having trouble with my uh, battery charger again. Might mean I need to to try to clean connections again or something. But uh, anyway, what I found most interesting was uh, some of the moral choices, some of the political machinations that went on in the in, in the story, but also. As another thing, and I've hinted at this in a couple of places, god damn it. Um, gotten used to it kind of working, and now it's really fucking annoying. Uh, is uh, uh, so a couple of the characters and how they're drawn. The only one, and, and you never see things from his point of view, and you only ever see... Th Actually, I know that uh, this does not cover one of the stories I read because it, it, previously, because uh, that one actually included something that, uh, that has stuck in my mind all, all the way. But there's one particular character which I just feel stands out as sort of the, the kind of... Um, the kind of thing that I would aspire towards. Now, not in all ways, but <laughs> in some. So the kind of thing, character that I latch on to, drawn and painted in, in a certain way, that's not necessarily, that's not at all positive in a lot of ways, which is uh, uh, Yoshim Stoiben. Uh, I think that's the proper pronunciation, uh, as opposed to, like, in, in, in the Spanish, the Joaquin, right? It looks like the same, same word, but... Anyway, uh, who, who's basically this really deadly fop who happens to be homosexual. That's the part that, uh, and, and, and he, gets, he gets kind of the shaft as it goes on. But he's just like this absolutely, like, murderous little bitch, right, in a lot of ways. But not... Like, it doesn't feel like he's, at least the way I saw him initially painted, it doesn't feel like he's necessarily particularly cruel or anything. He just happens to be very homicidal and very, very good at it, right? Um, but in the final story of the book, which is after the Slammers kind of return to their home country and have taken it over. Spoiler alert. <laughs> Oops. Should have given that first. Um, and not much of the story is about this, right? Like there's a couple of the short stories in here that are, that are, that are dealing with that. 
I got to get back to a point that I meant to make before, but I lost. But uh, they really start to turn him, or or Drake starts to turn him much, much into into something that I can no longer kind of accept. Right? Where I don't know. He he's just the. Uh, His, uh, his desires have become um, more malignant, let's just say, <laughs> and more unacceptable um, in a lot of ways. And, and he does start to seem more like someone who's willing to torture. Uh, he does start seeming a little less I don't know. See, I, I get this picture of sort of uh, the deadly fop that I really like, and maybe I latched onto that and didn't notice other things as much. But, uh, like, sometimes when he kind of giggles about stuff and things like that, like, hey, you could kind of play that off, though. I could kind of see that as, like, <laughs> they died. <laughs> um, but anyway, it, it was uh, it was very disappointing to me to see the character end up in that that place. And you know, sometimes characters go in ways that you just do not like. Well, what what ends up becoming of them? But it's a shame to me because it was someone I had latched on to and 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 could really appreciate before. Um, okay, so. To the thing that I really, really do like is the concept of short stories, sometimes sharing characters, but each about their own little vignette and each with its, you know, consistency as a short story, as much as like reading a Sherlock Holmes is or whatever, but that between them give you a flow of the overall tapestry. And I find myself really liking uh, books and, and, and stories, series, and whatnot that tell something where something interesting is actually happening, going from point A to point B on this overarching framing campaign of the stories. Uh, examples of this. Uh, Triplanetary, the first book of the Lensman series. I loved what it did. It gives you little, I think like three little uh, novellas, but between them, they give you the lead up to the Lensman. First Lensman goes into actually discovering the lens and whatnot. A lot less interesting to me, and all the rest, a lot less interesting to me. It, the first one, really, really exciting to me. Um, the first foundation book gives a number of pieces. Now, if you look at uh, the Osimo Foundation and Robots Universe all within itself, in a sense, it does that across the board. But long before he was worrying about that, the first foundation actually gave, um, you know, b before there was this desire to tie everything together. And it's the same way uh, Heinlein does the same thing with a lot of his stories, making them all kind of mashed together, bringing the characters together in it. M much, much worse, I think, in Heinlein's case. <clears throat> uh, because in Asimov's, he's stuck with the mortality of the humans that are involved in it, and only really uh, uh, Daniel is kind of immortal in any sense of the word. Um, but it still, it still kind of freaks me out to have, like, iRobot and, uh, you know, the robot uh, mystery series get folded into Foundation. That, that felt wrong. I didn't mind when, like, Pebble in the Sky is in there and stuff like that. But it feels completely wrong to be, uh, to mix these two. They, they just feel like very different worlds. Right, and he does it, but 
it's okay. But anyway, First Foundation was definitely like that. I'm trying to think what else. There are games that do this as well. And that was, uh, that was something that I was kind of um, looking to. Uh, Imperial Struggle is probably the most familiar to people, where it kind of uh, packages these little little scenarios. And what I'm doing right now, Sparta, it could have been like that. Um, Grand Sequel is, I think, the first game that I can think of that has that, where <coughs> smaller pieces are hung in a framework that allows the whole story to be told uh, within what is a single game, but also has small scenarios. Gloomhaven would have been a perfect example of that. Um, I really wish I liked the play of Gloomhaven. That, that's what really got in my way in that game, is the play. I did not enjoy playing the game, uh, my cards, etc. Anyway. This is a book <coughs> gives you story by story this buildup of insight into a broader span. And you could say, look, you know, you kind of get that with like Sherlock Holmes, right? Eh, I don't know, man. The only thing they do, the only way they link them together or the only way uh, Conan Doyle links them together is kind of the... Well, I remember when we were, you know, uh, is like some, some callbacks and stuff like that. But it doesn't really hang together and try to create a single tapestry with lots of zoom ins. And I feel like this actually manages to do that. I talked about it a little bit, I think, during my Sparta video, um, because that's what I was hoping as a game it would do. I'm always looking for games that give individual periods of, that give individual snapshots into um, a deeper, broad tapestry and, and differentiate between the two. But I do find myself loving the stories that do that, or, or, or I don't know, the worlds? <laughs> I don't know what to call it. Um, <coughs> I guess you could kind of say the Silmarillion is that way, in the sense that like it's a bunch of little stories, but I don't feel like it gives me the broad tapestry in the sort of way that I would like it to, um, and that that I feel some of these others do. What I really liked about say uh, Triplanetary and uh, Foundation is that largely it was new characters each time. That's true here, but you do see recurring characters show up. And you do see, you know, people that I think Drake found particularly appealing um, getting a bigger role uh, as, as the stories go on and on and, and, and being used again and again. Um, overall, I enjoyed this. I think I'm going to keep it. Uh, but... Yeah, it, uh, what I enjoyed of it was not particularly the military aspects of it. And although some of it is <coughs> the way the individual soldiers um, react to one another, to dangers, to situations, uh, more of it had, uh, more of my enjoyment had to do. I, I talked about the political and uh, uh, the moral implications. There's another thing. He puts little twists in these guys. Little twists that are really, really, you know, sometimes they, they really kind of are a twist of the knife as opposed to anything else. Um, and, and I have to say the one where the, uh, the, two, the two cultures end up seeing what they view most valuable destroyed because of their war. I, that was one of them. And I hope that's why I said spoiler alert. I, no, it wasn't. It was something else. But there, there are a couple of, uh, there, are, there are a number of these where there's just like this, huh, yeah, that's kind of cool. A, a lot of them you can kind of see where it's going to go. 
Um, but I had a couple of I had a couple of those little twists kind of surprise me at the end and make me smile. Or maybe I predicted them part way, but they were handled so well. So you know, I I, I found I think especially you know I mean writers develop, and I think so. Sometimes they develop for good, sometimes for bad. <laughs> but I, I think uh, it feels to me like there's a development to where uh, the stories become more interesting and more complex and richer. As opposed to when I look at, like, a Heinlein. Uh, the move, I think, did pretty well across the board. Uh, I think his later stories were fine. When I look at a later Heinlein, it feels like he's gotten juvenile. When I look at a later Piers Anthony, like, it's funny. His early stuff was okay. It was pretty good. Some of it was fantastic. And then it just became shit. And I, I don't know if it was like a, oh, let's get punnier and let's get schlockier. And let's put less effort in and just crank books out because they sell anyway and they sell better than, you know, the stuff that I actually had to work to do or something like that. Uh, that's quite possible. Um, the Discworld stuff, it, I, I don't, but I don't know, like, I don't think he evolved. <laughs> you know? It feels like he just took that kind of Piers Anthony type of uh, uh, hack writing style just threw it into everything. And, and, you know, it can be humorous. It can bring you a smile. Um, it's not as funny as Wodehouse. So, you know, take it that way. All right. I'll send this one out.